you being at your full capacity, thriving, honoring your needs, putting yourself first, and really ensuring that your hormones are optimized is everything when it comes to how you show up in this world. Your hormones were made to give you superpowers, not make you a super villain. Hello and welcome to today's interview. I've actually really been looking forward to this interview because it's been on the calendar for quite some time, but we had to wait for her new book to come out. I had to have it in my hands. It's so beautiful. And I want to tell you the behind the scenes story of how I met this amazing woman that I'm about to interview. We actually met like on a Zoom call with a bunch of other successful women that my friend Jill Stanton put together. And this woman just stood out to me because she just radiates confidence. And there was just something special about her. I immediately wanted to follow her online and just soak up all of her goodness. And she happens to talk about things that I'm absolutely obsessed with, which is hormone health and sex drive. Okay. So I know that if you listen into this episode, you're going to feel informed. You're going to feel empowered to learn more about your body and take care of yourself in a whole new way. So today we have on Dr. Jolene Brighton. She is a board certified naturopathic endocrinologist, a clinical sexologist, and a prominent leader in women's medicine. She's a fierce patient advocate and completely dedicated to uncovering the root cause of hormonal imbalances. Dr. Brighton empowers women worldwide to take control of their health and their hormones. She's an international speaker, an educator, a medical advisor within the tech community, and she's really considered a leading authority in women's health. So she is your Latina mom doc and author. Her book is this normal goes into sex hormones, your period, and the common hormonal imbalances people experience. So we're going to have a really great conversation today with Dr. Brighton. Welcome to the show. Yes. Thanks so much for having me here. And I have to say, so the libido chapter has a story about a friend at a baby shower. And to, I always change everyone's names, but I changed the name to Jill. And I didn't even think about it because I was like, this is so different than the per person's whose name it actually is. And then after the manuscripts like got accept accepted and it was already rolling and going to publish, I was like, oh, but wait a minute. I do have a friend named Jill, but I was just trying to go with the name. And I'm like, oh my God, Jill's been at a baby shower with me. Jill's going to think it's her. It's not her. Uh, but it's it's funny though how I try to change names and I try to go with like, what are kind of like, you know, very nondescript names. Like you wouldn't yes. like, and you know, it's not like, like, yes. I don't feel like Kayla as is, as, um, you know, as, as well used is like Jill is right. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. So Jill, if you're listening, it's not you in there. And now that you've said that, I'm like, everybody, it's not Jill. I promise you. It's not Jill. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. It, Cause I'm in the middle of writing my book right now and we're picking names too. And we're picking yeah. very like just names that I, I get what you're saying, like where you're like the exact opposite name that you can yeah. think of for that person. So it's so funny. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back <laughs> through the names and make sure. Do I have any connection to any of these names at all? I mean, it's hard. It's hard, right? To not have, like, I think I used Ashley in the book and it's like, I know so many Ashleys, so right. many Ashleys. <laughs> well, I feel like our generation, that was a very popular name, you know, Ashley, mm -hmm. And then now it's funny, my daughter, who's, she's 10 and I named her Charlie and I didn't yeah. know another kid named Charlie at the time. And then now it's like, there are so many girl Charlies out there. I was like, wow. Yeah. There's two 10 year old, 10 year old girls named Charlie that my son hangs out with here and in his class, at, like in his other schools and other places in the country, girls named Charlie. I think it's a great name for a girl. Me too. I'm like, why has this not been used more? So I'm obsessed. Yes. Cheers to the rise of the Charlies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So back to you, how did you become, you know, I think in order to write this good of a book, you have to be extremely passionate and almost obsessive with what you're talking about. 
how did you become obsessed with learning about female health? Oh, gosh. Well, firstly, thank you for for all the praise of the book. I really appreciate it. I did pour my heart and soul into it. It was three years in the making. It's a it's yeah. a it's loaded with like everything that you could need. You know, really, there was this moment where I was sitting in medical school and I had this epiphany of just how often women's medicine is done to them, not with them. It's mm-hmm. not a partnership. There was a lot of information that is gatekept, that women were misinformed about their body, that, you know, they just didn't get all of the information they needed to thrive. And that has always rubbed me wrong, how doctors will often say, like, let's watch and wait. Okay, sometimes we want to watch and wait. But what nobody recognizes is the amount of time that you spend not feeling well, scheduling doctor's appointments, making it to doctor's appointments, going to labs waiting and then being told that everything is normal and not feeling well. And as you know, and as your audience knows, like when you are thriving and you feel well, like you can literally take on anything and do anything. And in so many ways, I just really looked at the fact that we are missing out as a society on the contributions and the talents that women could be bringing because we're not giving them the information they need to care about their bodies. And then the nerd facts about me is that I have a background in chemistry. I love organic chemistry. I have a background in nutrition science. So marrying that with endocrinology, which is just basically a bunch of hormone pathways, totally my jam. And it's something that when it comes to hormones, it all makes sense to me very easily. And I realized that I have a knack for teaching this and teaching it in a way that empowers women to be able to take control of their hormones in ways that not even their regular provider can help them do. I love that. Now, when you said organic chemistry, I thought back to my OCHEM class, which was absolute torture for me personally, because I wasn't good at it. How did, like, what did you do as a child to, you know, get into that? Oh, you know, I think I was just, the thing about being a kid is I was always drawn to math. I was drawn to science. Like I was just always really passionate about it. It's just, a language that makes sense to me. And then I was also always really good at writing. And so the, like, it's so funny because I look back and I'm like, how did I, like, how did I ever like doubt myself? And this is my third book, like that I would be able to write a book. So getting into like, how did I get into organic chemistry? Like there was nothing that I think I really did to pursue that. What I pursued was my passion. And I looked at what brings me joy? What lights me up? And that's really what's been the beacon of what I follow in my life. I love that. I always like asking questions like that because it usually ends up being like that. Well, I just, you know, I read a book and I started to just pursue that and something lit up inside of me. And that kind of, it, it's what it happened with you, right? You're like, well, I just liked it. And so I kept doing it. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's important for people listening in to think about. It's like, what are those things that light you up? And are you pursuing them or are you pursuing the things that bring you down, you know, and weigh you down because you've got to pay bills or do certain things? Or because you're told you're supposed to be good at this or that's something that you should pursue, whether that's coming internally or externally. It's something that, so I homeschool my son and I really just try to guide him in his passions. In some ways, it's unschooling because it's about what he's passionate about and bringing in the education in that way. So rather than being like, you have to like read and write and it be very, very structured in a certain way, we more pursue like, okay, you're really into reading these books. So we're going to like, we're going to center writing around that. And I think we need more of that for everyone, that permission to pursue that which lights you up. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to say that. Not everybody has the privilege, the liberty, the access to things to be able to do that. But as a society as a whole, rather than trying to say that everybody should excel in all of these subjects, looking at what are your talents? What are the things that light you up? These are going to be the things that you can really bring forward into society and really contribute in such a big way. Mm, I love that. I absolutely love that. How old is your son? He's 10. Oh, I have a 10 year old and then I have an almost two year old. That's right. I remember we met, I think when you were pregnant because it was during, yes. you were pregnant yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So, wow. So you just started to pursue your passions. Were your parents 
uh, supportive? So not really. Okay. So this is, um, I want to say, like, I don't want to bag on my parents or my family in any way. My grandmother was an immigrant. My parents worked very hard. They had to work seven days a week. And from their perspective, college wasn't really an option. So what was said to me is that I needed to either A, find a man who would take care of me or B, find a trade and go into that. So I actually went into dental assisting when I was 16. I left high school early. I trained as a dental assistant and I got my first medical license at 18 as a registered dental assistant. And it wasn't until I was working with a couple of dentists in the central coast of California who pulled me aside. I thought I was in trouble that day. They took me in their office and they're like, listen, you are way too smart to be doing what you're doing. You need to go back to college. And really the messaging I received in my home is I wasn't smart enough to go to college. And I was like, I'm not smart enough. Like, I don't think I could. And they were like, this is crazy talk. You need to go to college. So they really pushed me into pursuing higher education. And so I didn't go back to college until, well, I didn't go back to school until I was 21. And then I just started hitting A's and everything and excelling. And I became a math tutor. I became a chemistry tutor. I taught advanced human metabolism when I was getting my master's. And I loved it and I was really good at it, but it just, it took, it took some other people who had seen a way. And that's really what I want to honor in that story is that my family had never seen a way. I'm a first generation college student and that didn't exist. Before me, that didn't exist. I even talk about being a Latina author. That didn't exist when I was growing up. I never saw people who were like me who are writing books. And I think it's important to recognize that if you don't see that pathway, it can seem a lot harder and you maybe it'll take you longer. Maybe you'll struggle more, but you could create that pathway for someone else. And you literally can be the example that you always looked for when you were a child. I love, love, love that. Where was your grandma from? She's from Mexico. So my family is, they're from Mexico. I actually grew up in, in her Mexican food restaurant, like working in their waiting tables, eating amazing food. But yeah, it's, it's funny because the other day, a friend of mine was like, oh, you're such a good cook. Like you should consider opening up a restaurant. And I'm like, my family worked so hard for me to be able to do what I did. And like, no diss. I think that if you own a restaurant, you need to be passionate about it. But I'm like, I would literally hate that. And my family would also be like, what are you doing? <laughs> you, yeah. what, what, you took on all this student loan debt and now you're like working a restaurant? Well, it's kind of like that thing, you know, you shouldn't always pursue everything that you're good at. Yeah. Right? No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So my grandma's from Chihuahua, Mexico. And they immigrated to Los Angeles. And then my last name, my maiden name was Angeles. So anyways, I love we have that in common. Yeah. And I love that last name. That's so beautiful. And I always say the only thing I know how to cook is Mexican food because my grandma taught mm -hmm. me, <laughs> but everything else, it, it really lands flat. So <laughs> I love that, that we have that in common. And the thing that you pointed out is you had somebody that spoke life into you because sometimes when you're so in it, you can't really see your gifts and your talents mm -hmm, until somebody so maybe true. exposes what they see in you. And so that's just a reminder for everybody listening in. Like if you see something brilliant inside of somebody else that maybe they are not seeing, take that moment to encourage them, take that moment to speak life over them. Because look, now you're impacting millions of people all over the world. I have chills saying that. That is so cool. Yeah, it is. And I love that you're telling people to do that because I think that we do not speak up and praise often enough. And I think, you know, sometimes we have these thoughts of like, that's amazing. And this person's so great that we don't, we don't say anything about it. Or maybe we don't think it's our place. Or maybe we think that's weird to just roll up to somebody and be like, here's how I think you're awesome. <laughs> let's make that, let's make that normal. Yes. Is yeah. this normal? We're making it normal. So <laughs> let's talk about, you know, how you, you got excited about female health. You wanted to educate people. And, you know, we don't really know a lot about periods unless you're somebody mm -hmm. that started to become passionate about it. I know that when I was 10 years old, I started my period, which is my daughter's 10. So any moment I'm like, is she going to start? And automatically had very heavy periods. 
my mom took mm-hmm. me to the doctor and at 11 years old, they put me on birth control, not because yeah. I needed birth control, but because I had heavy periods. There was no talk yeah. of nutrition, no talk of anything. Just, oh, we'll put her on birth control to regulate it. And so then I was on birth control for 10 years and I feel like it really messed me up. And I know you also Mm -hmm. have things to say about (laughs) birth control. And I tell people my story all the time and I'm not like an outlier. That happened to so many women. Mm -hmm. Why why do you think that is, that they just went straight to that answer? It's easy, effective, and it's been normalized. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. really such a common story of... I was a teen. I had these symptoms. My doctor said, here's birth control. Does it work? Yeah, it works a lot of times, but it's not addressing the underlying cause, what's really going on, and it can delay diagnosis. And that's what's really problematic is that if you have something like PCOS, for example, that birth control pill may help your acne. It will have you trigger the bleed whenever you go into the placebo pills, but it won't fix the underlying cause of that. And that underlying issue can lead to cardiovascular disease, diabetes risk, and that doesn't get talked about either. And, you know, what's interesting about you saying you were 10, we're actually seeing this, we're just moving backwards in terms of the conversations around periods. So in 2015, that was deemed the year of the period because so many women took to online talking about their period, talking about hormones, talking about their experience. And now there's legislation now being, they're trying to pass where it's like you can't teach girls about their period until they're 12 and no one can talk about it until sixth grade. And I'm like, but what about the eight-year-old who gets her period? And what about the 10-year-old? And what about, this is normal. And it's because of this association of like, well, periods mean fertility and that means babies and that's reproductive health and that's only for like older people, right? We don't talk to children about that. Yes, that is part of what these hormones are doing, but they're doing so much more in your body. And I do think we need to continue to normalize the conversation because how different would things be had your mom said, oh, well, you have heavy periods and you know, so-and-so had heavy periods and we talked about it and things that helped is that they actually like increased fiber and cruciferous vegetables in their diet and they made sure they were getting enough magnesium rich foods. And like, and if there was just a different conversation about like, what can we do at home? There's absolutely a time and a place for a doctor. But what if we were just having that normal conversation, we wouldn't be at the mercy of whatever the doctor has for us. We would have a lot more options. I'd love medicine to give more options, but at this time, it's mostly the pill. You know what uh, we did for all of, like we have a group of moms that all have fifth grade girls. And so we put together a period talk. We called it a period tea. So we had like tea yeah. and had this expert come in and teach about periods and she got them like period ready bags. And Mm -hmm. the point of the conversation was to teach them how our bodies work, but also to make sure they knew they could talk to each other about what was happening and what they were like feeling in their body, you know? And so if somebody started their period at school, they could go up to each other and say, Hey, do you have a pad or, you know, something like that. And uh, we had that talk about six months ago. And it's cool because it's opened up a lot of conversations with my daughter. And every day she's like, she has her period bag, like ready to go. It's hilarious. Um, But she's not scared of it is the whole point of why I'm really happy that we did the talk. And she just feels really empowered around the whole conversation. And, and I think that you're right. If we started to make it normal to have conversations like that with other women, at that same talk, it was funny because I was saying, I have heavy periods still. And it was before your book came out, obviously, because now I know what I'm going to do. But everybody was like, get an ablation, get an ablation. And I was oh, like, gosh, what? yeah, I know. But I was like, what? That happens? I thought it was the only one that still had like heavy periods in my, you know, late 30s. Yeah. And no, like, so now I'm so happy I found your book because I was really going to get an ablation to mm-hmm. get it fixed. So anyways. Yeah. And That's like, I just want to commend you for that because that is really just beautiful that you did that. It's something that we're doing in our community as well. And I have, I mean, my son, it was so funny because on Thanksgiving, we were at our friend's house. Her daughter's had her period. She was like, oh, I'm going to talk to my friend and you have to leave. And he's like, why do I have to leave? And she's like, because we're going to talk about periods. And he, (laughs) I just love him. He's like, 
but I probably know more about periods than you do. So why can't I stay? Let's talk about periods. And she's like, you do not know more about periods. And he's like, oh, yes, I do. And I was like, uh, facts, he probably does. Um, just because of by way of like, I mean, he was like three sitting on my lap while I'd be doing interviews and talks and learning about that. He built a connect set, like three or four, that was anatomically correct, uterus, cervix, ovaries, fallopian tubes, and like brings it to me, like wakes me up in the morning. And he's like, look, mom, it's the ovaries. Like what? Um, And like, so I'm raising him to be very body literate and period positive and supportive. I had to tell him, do not tell women you know their bodies better than they do. That's very offensive. (laughs) It's very, very offensive, especially when she's having this experience. But it is something that, you know, I teach my boys and I also, we have women in the community. Uh, I believe very much in moms and daughters coming together and having these uh, conversations. And the reason for that is because I want the parent to be the authority. And so sometimes it's like a, a single parent household and it's a dad as well. And like, let me just shout out to the men out there who have been reading my book and posting about it. So they're like, so I know what to expect with my daughter and I can help my daughter. I'm like, oh my God, I love you. Can we celebrate you? But I think we really need to normalize these conversations within our homes because it's my perspective. And really what I'd like to see happen is that parents become the authority in these conversations, that their kids come to them for whatever their needs are surrounding their body, rather than jumping to the internet first, or even their friends. Like they're going to talk to their friends, but their friends, the internet, all of this, it can be misinformation, but it also can be a source of shame. And I think we can have a real impact on future generations just by normalizing the conversation and taking away the shame. I love that. So moms listening in, start having conversations, start having conversations. So, so many people, they actually start to just accept that this is their life. Okay. Every Mm -hmm. time like that, I don't feel good. Every time I'm fatigued, every time I'm moody around my period, that that's just normal. So Mm -hmm. can you tell us what does a healthy period look and feel like? Absolutely. I think this is always the thing of like, we know when things are bad, but how do we know what's normal? So (laughs) we've all been told our cycle is supposed to be 28 days. Great framework for learning about it. Absolutely not true for majority of people. So a cycle from the day that you bleed until the next period, that can be anywhere from 25 to, or excuse me, 21 to 35 days. And if it's getting less than 21, for some people, less than 25 as well can be a sign that we've got too little progesterone. We have a failure to make enough progesterone, but this can be a range of normal. When it comes to the period itself, It's typically three to seven days. Most people are experiencing three to five days, but it can be up to seven days. If it's less than that, we start to think about low estrogen issues. If it's more than that, we start to think about excess estrogen issues. And that can be because of a variety of reasons. There can also be medical conditions that are contributing to that. When it comes to the flow, it is really normal to have spotting at the beginning or the end. If it's a day, that's fine. If it's like three days before, that's problematic. If you're finding your brown spotting at the end of your period, normal. That's just oxidized blood. If that lasts for like five days, not normal. Definitely want to get it checked out. I would say even if it goes more than a couple of days, we want to, we want to make sure that nothing else is going on. And then the flow itself. Second day is usually heaviest for everybody. And that can be, you know, when I say heavy, filling up a tampon or pad several times throughout the day. If it is every hour that you have to change that, you have to double up on like a super tampon and a pad, or you find that you're waking up in the middle of the night because there's so much bleeding, you have to change things. That's too much bleeding. That's when we're falling outside of the normal. And then the start stop thing that periods do (laughs) when they're like, oh, you're bleeding, you're having your period. Where did it go? Oh, it's back the next day. Like that is also normal. That can happen. And it doesn't mean that anything's necessarily wrong with you. There's a lot of people who talk about how period blood always needs to be bright, fresh red all the time. Like you're 
it's like this is like this ideal perfection that really it doesn't matter as long as there isn't like really, you know, thick copious amounts of clots and it's really so clots larger than a quarter not normal. But you know, if it's if it's ranging from that brown to like a dark red, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't always have to be bright red, but if it is like really clotty, really thick, and you're just like, what? Why is it so, so dark? That is worth investigating. So does that help in terms of like giving the range of what's normal? Absolutely. I think it helps me. I know it's going to help a lot of other people too. (laughs) As as you're talking, I'm like, I need to raise my hand. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, I think it's interesting because in your book, you talk about, you know, hormonal issues could be caused by lifestyle. Some, some aren't right. Mm -hmm. But what are some things that we can do to, you know, help our hormonal issues inside of our lifestyle? Yes. So strength training, regular exercise, everybody talks about, but strength training, building muscle mass is really important for sensitizing our insulin. So insulin is a hormone it basically knocks on the cell, says, I vouch for this glucose, this sugar, can you let it in? And it's great for doing that. It's not so great when we get insulin resistance going on and we can have a whole slew of other problems, but muscle helps us be more sensitive to insulin. And that's going to help with our adrenal function, our sex hormones, our thyroid, all of it. So strength training, decreasing stress, absolute must. And that doesn't mean adding in more things to decrease your stress. Sometimes it means taking things away in your life, taking away toxic people, taking away obligations that you don't really have to do, or taking away the shoulds. Like, oh, I should do this, but should you? Do you actually need to? So shedding some of that stuff. Increasing your fiber. So in the book I give, and I go into all of this in detail in the book, but I give a plate framework of what your plate should look like. We want to be aiming for 25 grams of fiber a day. It's going to help with our estrogen levels. It's going to help with our gut health. And at the same time, 25 grams is what we want to hit for fiber. And 25 grams is the max limit for sugar in the day coming in. If we're going above that, we're running the risk of that blood sugar instability. We're running the risk of building visceral adiposity that is fat that packs around our organs. And that's that's going to lead to cardiometabolic risk. So like heart attacks, all of that, but that is also disruptive for hormonal health. So we want skeletal muscle up, we want visceral fat down. And then the last thing I would say, you know, as we talk about lifestyle is not skipping sleep. I am, I'm with a toddler who still doesn't sleep. I don't know why my children just like hate sleep until they get to a certain age, but they do. (laughs) And so if you're a mom, if you are If you are a night shift worker, if you are doing anything that's causing, that's like, I have no choice but to not get as good of sleep, finding other ways, like sneaking in naps, doing things that you can do to get restorative sleep. So making sure you're sleeping in a dark room, a cool room, avoiding alcohol right before bed, heavy meals before bed. These kinds of things can help you get into that restorative sleep, that really deep sleep that's going to help you heal those hormones. Okay. I am obsessed because inside of the book, she actually breaks down her 28 day plan. It's called the 28 day program. And she tells you all the supplements that you might need. So you guys really want to pick up this book. It's going to be linked up in the show notes. So just a reminder to pick it up right now, grab one for a friend, grab one for a single dad. I love that idea that you said, uh, well, it was an idea, but <laughs> I'm going to now make it an idea for all the single dads I know. <laughs> uh, I absolutely love that. But one thing I want to point out here is in your lifestyle, enforcing boundaries. And in the book, you say unapologetically prioritize the hell out of your needs and the things that make you feel good and bring joy. And that actually will help your hor- hormonal imbalances. Like people yes. don't put those in the same category. They think maybe food right? Or other things that make sense. But this is something that could absolutely help. Why is it that us not having boundaries can affect our hormones? Tell us the scientific reason. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So if you've ever had that experience when you're interacting with someone and you leave and you feel depleted, like you feel more exhausted, and maybe even the next day you're feeling like that little bit of like hangover, like I just don't feel right. Your interactions with people can be inflammatory. 
They also can be depleting on those adrenal glands. So you're spiking these stress hormones and you're using up like basically your day's energy, your vitality for the day on this interaction. And often what happens is that we can have poor boundaries with people. So staying, saying no to people, saying, you, you know, we, we, we want to be communal beings and yet we're communing with the people that are not the best for us. So there's that aspect. And then there's also the aspect of taking on too much. We have a propensity of being human doings, not human beings. And so especially as women, we tend to be caretakers. We tend to, you know, be volunteering, to be doing all of the things to show up with our community in many, many ways. And if we don't have the boundaries to say, okay, is this in my best interest? And sometimes things, you know, sometimes you have to do things that are not in your best interest, but do less of those things if you can. Mm -hmm. Because if you are finding that you're not holding those boundaries, you're going to continually find those adrenal glands in a state of popping off stress hormones. If you're pushing out stress hormones, you can't make cortisol, you know, be your everything because it actually will age you at the cellular level, it's really bad for your cells. And so your cells will start down-regulating receptors. Things will start shifting so that you blunt that cortisol response. And at the same time, because you're in this stress response, you're going to see a decline in your progesterone. Now you even less want to be with people. Your PMS is way worse. Like you're feeling way more irritable. Your sleep is getting worse. And so these little steps of just holding your boundaries can make such a difference for your hormones. So if you ever leave a relationship, a situation, an interaction, and you're just like, man, I just feel depleted. I don't feel good. That is your hormones telling you this is not good for you. This is not good for your body. Oh, wow. I feel like convicted right now, feeling something. This is good. <laughs> this is good. So I want to switch gears here to go into talking about perimenopause because something I was like really surprised about was that people can actually start going into perimenopause, which can start at like 35 years old. And I'm 35. So that's where I was like, whoa, what? Okay. What the heck is perimenopause? Cause I thought I was like far away from it. Right. And so what yeah. are the common symptoms of that? Perimenopause is the decline of ovarian function. It is acceptable that at 45, you could go into menopause. Most people aren't going into menopause until their 50s, but perimenopause can start a decade before. And so that might initially just look like I'm having more PMS symptoms. I'm having more trouble sleeping before my period. I'm feeling more irritated by people in my life. Maybe I'm feeling more tired than I used to. Right. These are things where people are like, oh, you're just getting old. No, you're not just getting old. Your ovaries are shifting hormonal production. Then as things go on, periods might start to become a little off. Maybe they're heavier. Maybe they're becoming more irregular. And you start to notice more of the symptoms creep in over time. So having the exhaustion, the brain fog, the oh, hot flashes that everybody dreads, the night sweats, the trouble sleeping. And the thing about perimenopause is that you can't diagnose it with blood work. You diagnose it via symptoms. And so it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not a laboratory diagnosis. And in the book, I give a list of symptoms to evaluate each of your hormones. These are exactly the symptoms that we're using to evaluate perimenopause and understand what's going on. Now, just because you start having these symptoms doesn't mean it's a given. It really isn't until we get to that closer to menopause, like that 12-month crunch before your ovaries quit altogether. Menopause is diagnosed, by the way, when we don't ovulate therefore don't menstruate for an entire year, 12 consecutive months. And so when you're in that crunch and it's leading up to like, okay, the ovaries are about to stop, then we can see there can be a lot more symptoms and we may need bioidentical or just progesterone hormone replacement therapy. But prior to that, that's where like all of this lifestyle stuff we just talked about, the supplements that I go over in the book, the nutrition aspects, all of that can be really, really beneficial for reducing the symptoms and helping your ovaries thrive and do their best, even in those perimenopausal years. Now, let's talk about sexual health because I think that's why a lot of, a lot of women are listening in right now. They're like, okay, let's get to the good stuff. A lot of women I talk to, and I, and I mainly talk to very high performing women. So they're just like mm -hmm. movers and they're shakers. You know, you attract who you are. So <laughs> we just like get stuff done. 
they struggle with low libido. Mm -hmm. And I know anytime I feel like I'm not like feeling it, you know, I know it's because I'm in overdrive and somewhere in my life, like I'm not taking care of myself, like something's wrong. And most women though, they just think that's normal. Like they've never even had a libido. They look at sex as like a, oh, okay, fine. I'll do it. They don't like actually want to do it themselves. So can we talk about that? Because I want to, I've done other podcasts before about this. Like that is not normal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So firstly, if sex is not pleasurable, like if you're not interested in doing it, you really need to reassess the kind of sex you're having, the communication (laughs) you have with your partner. It should be pleasurable. The clitoris exists only for pleasure, has no other function but making you feel good. So it should feel good. In the libido chapter of my book, I really dissect all of the reasons of what can be going on when it comes to low libido. Is it really low libido? Or is it that your desire is more responsive, that things have to get going before your brain and your body align to be like, yes, okay, wait, because I'm just not the type of person to have sex on my brain all the time. But like once I'm once I'm reminded of how good this could be, then yes, things are moving in that direction. So there's the type of desire we have. There are There's this model called the dual control model, which talks about sexual inhibition and sexual excitation. So inhibitors, these are what people usually call turnoffs, but they go beyond what most people think about. And this can really be what is derailing the sexy train. So I like to use this analogy where you have a train track and that's like your nervous system. And the train, if you think about the train track being your nervous system, and the train is carrying all the sexual stimuli, so the sexy signals, it's a sexy train, if you will. And it's got to get to the brain. Because the brain is the main sex organ. It's got to receive that message. Now, as we were talking about the dual control model, that talks about sexual excitation. So we think about, people think about turn-ons when they say sexual excitation. And then there's inhibition. And the inhibition is like breaks. And those breaks can be laid across the train track even before you decide to have sex or your partner tries to initiate sex. And so that might look like things like Maybe you're struggling with your body image. Maybe you put on a pair of jeans that day and you're like, I just, I'm not feeling myself. I'm bloated right now or whatever is going on. So that lays one break on the track. Then maybe, you know, you're having a really hard day. Maybe you were in client meetings, somebody got really mad, there were miscommunications and like that was just a big stressor break on the train track. And now you come home at the end of the day and maybe you need to talk to your partner and you're like, it has been one of those days I need to talk to you. And your partner says, not now. I'm watching the game. Okay, Mm. break. Because you needed that communication. You needed that connection. You needed that relief. And then, you know, you, you end up going into the kitchen and realizing that they said that they would pick up dinner, but they did not. And they're like, oh, can you just make something really quick? Okay, another break. Because now you've got another thing put on your plate for the day. And so, Then the game's over. They come along. They decide like it's time to like initiate. Like, I mean, you could just be like at the kitchen sink and they're like, oh, wow, they look incredible. Let me, let me do this thing I know they like. So maybe it's, you know, kissing on your neck, for example. That sexy signal they're sending, that train cannot get through because there's too many breaks along the way. And so then we feel like I'm never in the mood. I've broken. Something's wrong with me. When in reality, what is going on is that there are breaks that we have to clear away. We have to recognize. So we need to tend, like body image, one of the hardest to work on. But I use that example because that is one of the examples that's for us to own. Then there's the relationship Mm -hmm. dynamic that we have to work on with our partner. There is our stress dynamic. And so all of this just illustrates how so many things can be impacting the nervous system's ability to receive those sexy stimuli that would get Mm. you in the mood. It's not because you're broken. It's not because you have a low libido. It's because life is going on and we have to, we have to tend to those things. And sometimes some of those things we have to like ignore and put on the back burner, like whatever happened with the client and you're trying to process it, but it's still in your mind. You know what? That's just, you got to let that go. You just got to let that go. So that's that aspect. But what is happening during all of this is also your hormones are shifting. So if we are in survival mode, if we are feeling completely stressed out or even a little bit stressed out, but the body is saying, as I survey the environment, things are not safe, stress hormones go up, sexy hormones go down, and anything that would lead to potential procreation out the window. And so you'll find that 
this is multifactorial, right? And that low libido could be related to everything going on in your life, pressing on your brakes. It could be related to your hormones. Your hormones themselves can be a break. And it may very well be that you're completely normal. There's no issue with your libido. It's just that you don't look like the media tells you you should look like. Oh my goodness. I have chills right now as you're saying that because I just had an epiphany. I had a breast explant almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I got my implants out. And after that, like, I mean, I'm talking like 18 months of like getting used to my new body. I did not want to have sex at all. And I thought it was just from stress. Like I literally was just like, I'm just so under stress. and But now it makes sense. It was my body image. Yeah. I mean, that can definitely be part of it. You know, a lot of new moms go through that as well. I think in the first year postpartum, like you're getting used to this new body, but then it's not even really your new body because it's going to change again. And Mm -hmm. it can feel like, you know, one of those times where it's like, I'm not sleeping, so I'm tired and there's all these things going on. And that it can feel a lot like your partner's just like, just forget all of that. Like just have sex anyways. And I will tell you that truly, when partners are having sex, they're not paying attention to your cellulite, your rolls, your stretch marks, any of that stuff that we tend to worry about as women. And that can get us trapped in the spectatoring. That is, you are aroused, you're ready to go. Maybe you're even about to have an orgasm. And then you sit on the sidelines and you watch yourself and you criticize yourself instead of being in the moment with that pleasure. What do you think is going on inside of us that makes us feel shame around having pleasure? Oh, I mean, this is such a big, big can of worms, right? To I know. Because there is the way that we've been marketed to our whole life. And I, I go through, I touch on some of this in the book. There's the marketing. There are the sh- the TV shows that we've grown up with, the things that they've shown us is normal. There are the things that maybe religion has told us is normal or not okay. There are even interactions with our own medical providers that have really left us feeling like, wow, like something's wrong with me. And so there's a lot of reasons that contribute to us feeling ashamed, us around around sex, around our bodies, around pleasure. And as I say in the book, I mean, from the moment that you're taught about your body, that someone starts talking to you about it, you're usually taught that it's a source of shame. Now, when you decided to write this book, what was the main message that you wanted people to take home? I really wanted people to understand what their normal is. So to understand what's normal, what's not normal in terms of needing to see a doctor, but getting in the the part of the 28-day program is, yes, we want to heal your hormones. Yes, we want to make those hormone symptoms go away. Yes, we want to help you find more pleasure. But I also have you going through exercises and different experimentations with your own body so you can figure out what your normal is. The reality is, is you live in your body. You're the expert on that. You're the only one that knows what your normal is. And we get so much messaging that's external telling us what is and isn't normal that has us caught up really expending our energy in trying to chase like whatever, whatever expectation, you know, is the new fad or, you know, the new people that you're hanging around with, like the things that they're saying or like the new, you know, trend in media. We're chasing all of these things, trying to figure out what's normal. And it's really us who possess the ability to understand our normal. I love that. And every, every chapter is like, is menopause normal? Like it's all about like asking the questions that we, we need to be asking of ourselves. And so I love that you, you really accomplished your mission with first, you know, writing the book. And I think it's for every single person out there. Like, I don't think it's like, oh, it's only for 30 year olds. It's only for 20 year olds. I wish I had this book when I was 13. It's been so interesting because I wrote the book like thinking like, yeah, most likely it's going to be women mid-20s, you know, that that's going to be like the minimum age and older that are reading the book. And I've had so many moms that are like, I'm going through this book with my daughter. Like I have my teenager looking at this chapter, reading about this, saying the same thing. It's the book they wish that they always had and that they wish they had had when they got their period. Mm. Okay. So now I have to talk entrepreneur life with you because first of all, it's just great marketing. You're a great marketer. I follow you (laughs) online. I love your reels and your TikToks. Like you're so good at what, 
people call edutainment, right? Mm -hmm. Entertaining us and educating us at the same time. And did you know that the book was going to be called, is this normal? Judgment free, straight talk about your body. I want to know how you came up with the name. I actually did not come up with the name. So I was going to call the book what the sex ed teacher didn't say. And my agent was reading the, my manuscript and she's like, this book should be called, is this normal? And I'm like, why, why do you think that? I don't know. I never think about like putting a question mark, like in, like, I feel like books are statement. Like that's how you do a title as a statement. And she was like, because it's seriously what everybody, all of these questions are what everybody asks me online. My patients ask me, my readers at drbrighton.com. And she's like, it's what they're asking over and over. Is this normal? Is this normal? Is this normal? She's like, the book has to be called as this normal. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Okay. Let's roll with it. And then it was my editor who's really brilliant. I mean, I was like, this is, this is the libido chapter. Can you help with the subtitle name? Like, can you make it spicier? And she came up with the subtitle for the book as well. And so it was really a collaborative effort, which is great because it allowed me to focus so much on the meat of the book. The content. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I love also the O, if you're watching this on YouTube. (laughs) <laughs> Look oh, yeah. at the O and normal. It's like perfect. And it's confirmation. We just changed the title of my book and it's a question. Mm-hmm. And it was also my editor too that was like hammering me. Like I wanted this other title so bad. And she was like, people, that is not going to make people pick it up in Barnes and Noble. Yeah. And I, I think the new title will. And this is like, you're interrupting people's pattern in their brain. because They're going, whoa, did she just hear me ask that? Like in my own mind, was she in my mind? I think that's what great marketers do. So it sounds like you had a really great team around you to get this book out. What is one surprising thing that happened like that you didn't expect, right? Since this book launched. Oh gosh. The, the dad thing I didn't. So I was like, this book is for all bodies. I want everybody to read this and to see, I didn't expect dads to go to social media and make videos talking about how other men need to read this book so that they understand women's bodies. They understand it for their partner, for their sister, for their mother, for their uh, daughters. And just seeing how many men are advocating that other men read the book has really blown my mind. And it's not one of those like, hey, I'm going to tell my friends about it. It's like, I'm putting this on TikTok and everybody's going to see that I want other men to read this book and I'm reading this book. That I'm like, what era are we in? Because I'm here for it. (laughs) <laughs> I I love that. I'm so surprised at that as well. And I just think it's, we're in that age of social media where people, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you didn't know what you didn't know. And yeah. now we're so exposed to what we don't know. And mm-hmm. so it has that curiosity part of our brain that just wants to keep learning. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a good thing. So I'm excited. I'm definitely going to pick up some, some books for the single dads in my life and help them out. What is one thing you want to leave all of the mommy millionaires with? I want to remind them again that you know you're normal and to trust that and to understand that you being at your full capacity, thriving, honoring your needs, putting yourself first, and really ensuring that your hormones are optimized is everything when it comes to how you show up in this world. Your hormones were made to give you superpowers, not make you a supervillain. And in the book, I want to teach you exactly how to leverage those superpowers so that you can absolutely excel beyond your wildest dreams. Mm, So good. Mic drop right there. So I want to do something fun for all of you that have listened all the way through this episode and you've absolutely loved it. I want you to take a screenshot of this episode right now and post it on your social media (laughs) and tag at us, Kayla Craft and Dr. Jolene Brighton on any social media platform. And I'm going to pick 10 people to gift a book. Is this normal too? It's such a good book. For those of you guys that, you know, want to just get a head start right now, go and purchase the book. And if you happen to get a free copy from us, then you can gift that to somebody else that you love in your life. This is a book that you keep around and you give the gift. So I just want to honor you for doing this work for us females to feel better, to feel more confident, and to know 
you know, oh my gosh, this is normal. This isn't normal. And giving us just that, really that confidence to make sure that we're doing what's best for us and not what's best for our neighbor, right? But what's best for us. So I am so thankful that you've done this work for us. And I'm excited for more people to get this book in their hands. And I just really appreciate you. I could go on and on and sing your praises, but thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to make sure to link up all of your social media in the show notes and also the book for everybody to purchase. So go purchase it right now. Thank you for being on. Thank you so much. I appreciate the conversation.